I wanted to talk to you today about the origin of new ideas. So our society is driven by new ideas, from the social networks created by Facebook to the information access that's been enabled by Google or the mobile devices that are provided by Apple. Each of these technologies started originally as an idea in someone's mind. In the scientific arena, we can look at the discovery of the structure of DNA by Watson and Crick in 1953, which answered a question that had been asked for centuries. That is, what is the mechanism by which traits are passed from parents to their children? So this idea, this discovery, then has had a profound change in our understanding of the biological world and has enabled a huge array of medical technologies. More recently, the cloning of Dolly the Sheep by Ian Wilmot and colleagues unleashed a new technology whereby we could now take our cells and drive them back to their original embryonic state, creating stem cell-like populations. And that, in turn, has enabled a, a new approach to discovering drugs for degenerative diseases and a whole new strategy for regenerative medicine, as it's called now. So these are clearly transformative technologies, and where do these ideas come from? Do they come suddenly out of nowhere in a dazzling moment of clarity, a, a true eureka moment, or is it something more complex? So this question was brought home to me one day recently when I was teaching a class, and the students were working on an assignment to create an original research proposal. So they had to come up with a new idea and then think of a set of experiments whereby they could test and develop their new idea. Now, almost all the students had an idea and needed help thinking about how do they test it, how do they develop it, how do they refine it. But one student came to me and he sat down in my office and he said, well, how do I come up with a new idea? And I thought that was a great, profound and important question. Is there a process by which we can actually begin to prospectively try to come up with new transformative ideas? So I want to try to answer that question today by taking you through some of the big discoveries, important findings within a specific field. And that's the, the field that tries to understand how death operates at the level of cells within our bodies. So we call this cell death and it's critical in humans and mammals, for example, in sculpting our tissues as we develop from an embryo. So in the formation of our fingers and toes, we have to have cells die at a specified time in development. Cell death also goes awry in diseases like in cancers where tumor cells become resistant to cell death or in neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Huntington's and Lou Gehrig's where we see excessive cell death in the nervous system. Now, originally, the conventional wisdom regarding cell death was that cells just break down over time, sort of like your car. They wear out over time, and gradually, nonspecifically, they just erode away. In 1972, our kind of modern understanding of cell death is traced to a paper by Andrew Wiley and colleagues, where they systematically reviewed the literature in cell death and carefully examined what was known about how cells die. And what they noticed was very striking, that there were two ways that cell cells could die in terms of the appearance of the cells as they underwent cell death. There was the more classic type of cell death, which they called necrosis, and yet there was a distinct way that cells were dying in these observations that they reviewed that they termed apoptosis, for a, a different, stereotypically kind of regulated form of cell death. So that brings me to rule number one, which is know what is known. Wiley and his colleagues succeeded because they systematically went in and had encyclopedic knowledge of the literature and were able to pull together information that was already available to anybody, but they were the ones who could see this pattern that had eluded everybody else. Now, building on Wiley's work, Bob Horvitz and his colleagues at MIT came up with a hypothesis that there would be specific genes that control cell death. Now, before that time, the assumption was that, again, cell death was a kind of unregulated process and you wouldn't be able to prevent it. But it turned out to be true that there are specific genes, because if you delete these genes, then the cells that are scheduled to die at a particular time in the development of the organism don't die, 
and they persist on as so-called undead cells. So that leads me to rule number two, which is don't believe untested assumptions. Again, this idea that cells must die through an unregulated process was never tested. There was never any data to support that idea, but it went lurking in the back of our minds as the kind of base assumption that everybody worked under. And it wasn't until somebody, Bob Horvitz and his colleagues, had the idea to specifically test that, that untested assumption that we could change our paradigm. Now, more recently in my laboratory, we were searching one day for small molecule drug candidates that could kill tumors with a particular mutation to develop a kind of personalized medicine. And in one case, we tested 20,000 different drug candidates to find these that would have this very specific activity, and we found just one that had the desired activity. So it was a true needle in a haystack. We named this special compound Arastin. Now we had an unexpected observation regarding Arastin, that when we began studying how it killed these tumor cells with this particular mutation, we found that it didn't seem to activate apoptosis or necrosis. I'm going to show you a little video here where you can see how the cells die when they're treated with Arastin. You'll see that they begin rounding up and they detach from the surface and then at the end, they undergo this kind of explosive death of the cytoplasm, and what's left behind are these kind of nuclear ghosts, where the nucleus, the center of the cell, is there unperturbed, even though the rest of the cell has been eliminated. So we already knew at this time that this was an important uh, type, uh, characteristic of cell death, because in, in apoptosis and necrosis, we know that nuclei get severely damaged, suggesting that something different was happening here. And I'm grateful to uh, Dr. Scott Dixon, a postdoc in my lab, for taking this time-lapse image of Arastin-treated cells. So this leads me to the third observation, which is don't be afraid of observations that don't fit. That might seem like a strange uh, rule to make, but at the time that we originally discovered that Arastin was acting through this unusual mechanism, it made me nervous made me nervous because I realized that to convince other people that this was really acting through a different form of cell death would take many years and a huge amount of work. And wouldn't it really be simpler and easier if we could just check the box that this compound was acting through apoptosis or necrosis? And that's often the case with research. It's quicker, easier to publish, to get grant funding, if we're working within that existing paradigm. But of course, the most exciting observations are the ones that don't fit, and so those are the ones that we have to treasure. So this has been very exciting for us. Uh, it's as if we're mapping the space of cell death, and we thought we knew the major continents, apoptosis, necrosis, and then suddenly we have this huge uncharted area for apoptosis, as we call this new form of cell death, and so we're beginning to untangle the mechanisms, the genes and the proteins that control this form of cell death. We've identified now some candidate uh, drugs. They're probes still, they're not drugs yet, but that can activate ferroptosis, this new form of cell death, in specific kinds of cancers. And we think ferroptosis now may actually be involved in certain neurodegenerative diseases like Huntington's disease and Lou Gehrig's disease. We're trying to understand what role it plays there and whether we could prevent this and ultimately have a, a therapeutic strategy for these terrible diseases. So I'm going to turn now to rule number four, which is don't worry about the timeline. So it's taken us about a decade to unravel this new type of cell death and some of the key mechanisms that underlie it. Now, if I knew at the beginning that it would take 10 years to do that, would I have started out on that path? And I might have been dissuaded because it's difficult to convince a graduate student or an undergraduate to work on a project that's going to take 10 years. It's difficult to obtain funding. But of course, it's worth the wait. The great advances, the, the exciting research are often the ones that take that long period of time. So I'll conclude with these four rules to remember. Know what is known. Don't believe untested assumptions. Don't be afraid of observations that don't fit. Don't worry about the timeline. And hopefully with these rules as guideposts, we can all play our role in transforming society. Thank you. <laughs>